Lara, I know you have something you want to share about a segment in last week's Pop News. I do, I do. I screwed up. I did. The comment I made about dance was insensitive, it was stupid, and I am deeply sorry. I've spoken with several members of the dance community over the past few days. I have listened. I have learned about the bravery it takes for a young boy to pursue a career in dance. A few months ago, the American TV presenter Lara Spencer had to publicly apologize after ridiculing Prince George for taking ballet. But when you think of ballet, you probably think of ballerinas in tutus. For many years, the man has been a figure of fun, not quite manly enough, and only there to help the women look good. But things are changing. At the Royal Ballet, there is a golden generation of male stars. They've got huge fan bases. Through their virtuosity, they can move audiences, not just with power, but also with grace and beauty, too. Perfect. That's it, better. They're even challenging our preconceptions of masculinity. So what I want to know is, what's it really like to be a man in the world of ballet today? So before we start, let's get one thing out of the way. Something we're probably all thinking about, but too embarrassed to ask? What does the male ballet dancer wear down his tights? For people's information, we do not pad these. It's basically like a glorified thong. We need these to support because we, we move so much and we, we cross our legs so much. So it avoids um, chaffing, that sort of thing? And, and, yeah, yeah, because yeah. actually... It just takes the stuff crashing. out of the way. It takes it out of the way, because otherwise, like, whenever you cross the leg, you oh, know, right. it, it, if, if it's not out of the way, it's on the way. Yeah. <laughs> and you would choose different ones depending on what you're Depending on comfort. See, like, th this one have like, a really chunky elastic, so it gives you a little bit of muffin top. <laughs> 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 Whether his doesn't. <laughs> I know it's trivial, but it illustrates the kind of ridicule male dancers have had to go through for years. When really, in truth, when you look at them, they're more like Olympian gods. Matthew Ball, Ed Watson, Marcelino Sambe, and perhaps the most celebrated, Vadim Montagirov. These are the guys bringing ballet to a new audience. I'm just so happy that within this generation of male dancers that we're showing male dancing is athletic, beautiful, lyrical, artistic, and is definitely a job that is for a man in the 21st century. Not just any man, though. I think it's fair to say there aren't many of us who could be an elite ballet dancer. Sleeping Beauty is currently in production at Covent Garden, the classic tale of a princess cursed to sleep for a hundred years by an evil fairy, set to the music of Tchaikovsky. When you think of this classic, you think of the ballerina. Too much? <laughs> no, too, too little. Oh, oh well, yeah, maybe come with, let her come with a long arm. And yet, arguably, one of the most difficult dance routines in this whole production is performed by a man. It's called Bluebird. It's a one minute solo in the final act of such intense energy and precision. It's gained a kind of notoriety amongst young male dancers. Cesar has been cast as the Bluebird for this latest run. Just explain to me about your, um, your shoes there. I come from a family of professional ballet dancers, and my father, uh, who was a principal dancer with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, used to wear these boots when he was training. 
So these boots are just extremely special to me. They are quite, um, how should I say, distressed. Yeah. If you like me to demonstrate like a manage, like there's like a manage was just a simple manage. So you like doing the big jumps, is that the same? Oh yeah, I definitely say that's my thing. It comes naturally to me. And apart from that, I think also I'm Cuban. So in general, Cubans are known to, to be those turners, jumpers, and the big double tours and the exciting things. So that's a basic. That's something that is pretty much in everything. So this is like a double tour, let's say. My next show is Bluebird. It's one of those uh, dog I likes because it's so tiring. Like you spend more time in the air than on the floor. Just constantly jumping and trying to suspend. And then in the cola, you do this like a whole bunch of times. And that's when you're already exhausted. And then it's like, basta. <laughs> but you love jumping. Yeah, I love jumping. <laughs> it's like actually makes you want to throw up. Your body goes all uncoordinated because you're just so fatigued. <laughs> but you just have to get through it. Cesar's run of performances of Bluebird begin in a few days, but he's also rehearsing for his debut in another ballet, Coppelia, which is almost as hard as Bluebird, but not quite. Good. Good. Excellent, darling, good. Good. <laughs> 23 is the perfect age for such demanding roles. Fabulous, 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 fabulous. You certainly wouldn't attempt Bluebird in your early 50s. I've already done 12 minutes earlier, then I put the costume on, and I come back another four minutes, and I go down stage and straight on. My, it's my warm up for Enigma variations. As you get older, your muscles are not as, as not as flexible, so it warms my back up. Phil is starring in a period ballet about the life of the composer Edward Elgar. Former dancers often go into coaching or choreography. Do the arabesque and the arm will wrap around him as you're going down. Or they can carry on performing as a principal character artist. A part that requires a bit of acting, but not Olympian levels of fitness. When Christopher, Gary and Phil first fell in love with ballet as schoolboys, it was the 70s. It was a time when the nation laughed at things like Benny Hill and Carry On films. And of course, the sight of a man wearing tights. What is your space then? This is my space. This is the neatest space in the whole opera house. <laughs> Have you done that for me? No, 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 no this, is every, this is every day. This is every day. He'll be in two or three hours before getting ready, and that will no, all be set not. up. No, <laughs> That's my makeup. I've got one little tray. Yeah. And Chris yes. has one of the oldest pancakes ever. My pancake's actually got a bit of mould on it. <laughs> so that needs scraping before I use it. Use it again. My sponge has rust on it. How old is your sponge? And this is my little... I've, mine's nearly that. as old as yours. Makeup tray, that. It's what we had something. from 30, I, mine's 30 years old. Well, it's, um, yeah, we can't even makeup. see the numbers. What's interesting about that is it just that it's very old. It is. All right. And not as old as me. <laughs> A lot of people say that the male ballet dancer has been stigmatised over the years. Do you think that stigma has been banished now? Uh, oh, not really, not fully. I mean, people, I... if they want to make a joke, will still make a joke about men wearing tights. There's less of it, but you still get that odd joke and you just sort of think, oh, it's an old, boring joke, isn't it, men wearing tights? Yeah. Well, I think it also comes from, if you think about just recently, there was the whole controversy with the um, American TV presenter who 
was taking the mickey out of uh, Prince George, who yeah. was going to be taking up ballet lessons. Yeah. I grew yeah. up with it. I grew yeah. up with bullying, but it actually made me more dogged and more determined to do it. I think it made also, me stronger. being a straight man, it seems that they always say, oh, the, you've got to be gay to do ballet, but you don't. You can be straight to do ballet. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's just a good art form. It's a career and it's something that you take up not because you you're, you have a gender. You, yeah. you take yeah, it up because it's something it's, it's yeah. you know. Because you have a talent too, you know, you want to dance. It's a really physical form of athleticism, and actually, really. dancing is the most basic thing to do. A basic human instinct is to walk, make some sort of music and dance. Prince William says George absolutely loves ballet. I have him. news for Love you, that. Prince William. We'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Lara Spencer. I bet she wishes she could turn back time. Look at all these men who came out in support of Prince George in Times Square. She has obviously never seen Vadim Montegirov dance. His power, technique and grace have set a new bar for the male dancer. You can always touch the ceiling, so it's hard to shoot over. It's no surprise he's known here as the dream. I'm heavier. I'm, I'm two kilos heavier. <laughs> he shares a dressing room with Alexander Campbell. We don't score a lot of points when we play one-on-one. It's really warm. And they was like, oh, two minutes before it has so It's true. That is actually, that's what happens. Um, <laughs> and then you go to rehearsal, I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah, do you want to do your solo? No, I'm a bit tired. But, you know, what's funny is that we joke about that, but, you know, I, I've seen Vadim go into rehearsals where, you know, he's been working super hard and he's like, oh, I think I'll take it easy. And then he gets in there. And he's just flying across the room doing 100%. I was like, what's that? I thought you said we were going to take it easy. He said, yeah, you know, but I'm in there, so I might as well do it properly. Can you play halfway through? One of the reasons they call me a dream is because I'm doing what partners want. <laughs> so if they want me to hold her that way, I'm holding that way. And that comes from school. That's what they taught me, that uh, you are a, a male dancer, you have to do what girl asks you to do. Ballet's school, White Lodge in Richmond Park, there are children from all over the world, but the style of teaching is different to what Vadim experienced in Russia. Come on. His school was very traditional. Growing up in Russia, if I look back at it now, it's like, oh my God, how did I survive? <laughs> because I was there for six years. It's Perm Ballet School. We were very scared of them because we were nine years old boys so i remember my teacher he was really really tall he was two meters uh, long and he stopped the music and there was that silence for five ten seconds and that's usually the worst <laughs> you kind of you stand there and you know it's it's about to happen <laughs> and then he's screaming at us and no frowning but then i understand straight away <laughs> after that there wasn't a mistake up off the leg, lift up off the right hip. White Lodge takes about 15 11-year-old boys each year. Turn and first open down chest. 
If you impress at White Lodge, you transfer to Central London and the Royal Ballet's Upper School. Here, the young dancers are in touching distance of their dream of joining the corps de ballet. Hold that. A hundred 16 to 19 year olds hone their craft in classical ballet here, but only a handful will get selected to move that short distance across the road to the opera house. Pique, double pique into fond du arabesque. These lads have been living together in lodgings for two years, but in just two weeks, they will find out who has been offered a place in the Royal Ballet. Down, up, down, step, good. Who's got the worst habits? Oh, that's a hard. Well, now we're older, the habit, the bad habits are like not doing your washing up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we're sharing a room, so. We've got complaints by our house parents, like the cleaners can't actually clean anything <laughs> because the floor's just non-existent. You can't open the door to get in. Yeah. <laughs> and how did it feel to arrive here? I think there was only two boys in my old ballet school. And everyone there likes football, and they think that all the boys, their dreams is to do football, not ballet. So it was a bit of a, the odd one now. At one point, I had to choose ballet or football, and my dad wasn't happy. He didn't really speak to me for a bit. <laughs> Everything my sister got was pink tutus, and boy stuff always has footballs or it's blue. And so as soon as you say you're doing ballet, everyone's mind goes straight to pink tutus and so they can't they can't see it any other way so to imagine a boy doing that suddenly seems feminine most adults if they don't have an idea of what ballet is they just sort of think it's a girly thing and it's not hard work but people that know ballet they realize it's strength and grace at the same time When you watch someone like Matt Ball, he is the epitome of strength and grace. I felt like at a young age, I was totally obsessed with it. It was everything to me. You know, when I was younger, I remember my parents had like built-in wardrobes with mirrors on the front and I was just in front of them all the time, like kind of trying to replicate images that I'd seen. Matt is now a star principal here, but he began at White Lodge. This was when I was promoted to principal dancer of the company with love, mum and dad. I feel like they're helping me to savour it. I remember this on summer holiday, kind of stretching on the balcony, and I used to make my mum help me with the stretches and shout at her if she got it wrong. <laughs> the Liverpool Echo. Yeah, the Liverpool Echo. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It's funny as well, because I remember at the time thinking that I was, like, the bee's knees. Like, I've made it... I think I thought, like, it would all just slip into place, and it, you know, it definitely took a lot of hard work still on the way. When I first did the Nutcracker, meeting Prince Charles, you put a lot of effort What a lovely into family you've got. Yeah, very. We would see each other maybe every two or three months. Uh, I think it must have been hard for them, you know. I could tell every time, every time that I left them that it was very hard for, you know, for both my parents and, you know, I guess especially for mums, like, you know, trying to hide their tears or whatever at that moment, it's really tough. Like I say, I was very sure of it, um, but it still was a massive, massive leap, I guess. Does yeah. that make you feel emotional when you think about that? Yeah, it does, yeah, definitely. Have a couple of minutes, and then we will go back and do a few bits. Why is it that ballet is seen as feminine when really it's not the case? I think it must be because the language of ballet is gracefulness, and grace and elegance are still seen as female attributes. But if you think about it, grace is actually used to disguise all the brute strength needed to do the lifting. It's definitely not something I would try. 
what does a, a ballerina look for in a good male ballet partner? Um, strength. Nationality. Strength. So you've got to be strong. Um, you want to feel safe on stage. Um, it's nice when they're musical. Um, and then just like some chemistry as well, like something that you feel on stage. Yeah. Some sensuality. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie is very, she's known for connecting. There's a lot of connection <laughs> with the partners. <laughs> she could, no. <laughs> that's she, but that's the thing. She looks at you like. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, oh, you're, yeah. you're not looking through. Yeah, you're, looking, you're like inside yourself. Inside, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, come on in. This is our dressing room. This is where we spend most of our time. As you can see there are costumes ready for our next performance on Thursday. We eat here, we prepare for shows here, we prepare for rehearsals. This is my place, my name on. I feel like the longer you're here, the more decoration you have, I think. Usually the best seats are the ones at the sides and are taken by the more veterans. If you become a principal, like Matt Ball or Vadim, you get your own dressing room, but the ranks below have to share one big one. Valentino is a first soloist. And this is William Bracewell. Did you have to check my, my name? I did. Like that? <laughs> I did What's his surname? <laughs> Bracewell. <laughs> He's a uh, first soloist for the company. Our brightest up-and-coming stars. <laughs> The young men here might be having their moment, but that doesn't mean that all aspects of ballet are now equal. We are spoiled here. I mean, the Royal Ballet, we have some of the top dancers in the world. So if you don't get that ballerina, you get another ballerina who's just as good and just as light. But, um, but I think in, in general, as male partners, you don't really have a say. Usually you get assigned. And the ballerina, it's the ballerina who gets asked like, would, you, would it be okay for you to dance with this up and coming young partner? Or would you, work, would you like to work with this guy that you worked before, but you had a fallout in that particular production? Or would you like to change it? So they do get asked because really, like, it's, it's not, not that it's just about them, but like, they have to feel more comfortable. We get it's, assigned. It is them. kind of them who are yeah. laying themselves on the line in terms of how much trust they give to the other person. But you gotta be there. <laughs> you can't be the one like, oh my God, it's <laughs> amazing. Just on the floor, right? Like. <laughs> Valentino has been in some of the Royal Ballet's best productions and he's had big roles too, such as in Don Quixote. But despite this, he's never been promoted to the rank of principal. Like Vadim and Matt Ball, Valentino became obsessed with ballet when he was very young. It was a bit of a calling for me. I started when I was three. I watched Mikhail Baryshnikov on TV and just instinctively I was, I want to be like that. I've got a hell of a lot of pictures here. I've got some really cute baby pictures <laughs> of me doing ballet. I've got a lot of ballet. That's me dancing, being very ridiculous. This is so intense. <laughs> that was me when I was probably eight years old, nine years old. I can't say I'm fully satisfied right now with how my, my career is going. It, it is frustrating to have in our career dictated by ballet directors, really. It can be like you have to be at the right place at the right time, or it can be personality, or it can just straight out be like favoritism and you just don't fit that. And that's, that's the truth and it, it happens to all of us. I think that I have a lot more to give than they give me credit for. And I, I've expressed that, so it's not like a secret. I've, I've obviously expressed that to them and I will have to assess whether to do something about it.
Valentino must decide if his future is to be with the Royal Ballet. At another, less prestigious company, he could well be a principal. But would that be the right move? The principals at the Royal Ballet enjoy exalted lives, adoring fans, huge Instagram followings, modelling contracts, even super fans who watch their every performance. You know, it can be quite intense. Um, often after a show, you're physically and emotionally exhausted and you have to kind of go out to the stage door and sign autographs and, and be very pleasant, which which is um, not at all a negative thing, but um, it's not necessarily what you choose to be doing at that time. I think often you, you kind of feel like you need a moment of quiet reflection. This is painted by a fan of me performing in Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake. And I'm quite a fan of it anyway, because it makes me look pretty muscly, but I'm not sure that's as good as that in real life. <laughs> but um, sometimes these people, they come to the show so regularly that they begin to know the choreography. Um, I have received, not corrections, but I have been told, been pointed out something, a mistake that I made on stage after the, uh, after the performance by a fan. And it's kind of... It's hard because you, you you obviously wouldn't deny it, but um, it doesn't feel exactly like the right moment to be reminded of your mistakes. It's almost like they're here. And it's so, it doesn't, it doesn't read. And I Imagine getting notes, not just from your ballet master, but your fans as well. Go, go. Go. The pressure to succeed comes from all sides. <laughs> and there can be a cost to that. Stephen McRae is the dancer with the most Instagram followers, 200,000. And he uses his account not just to post about the shows and the photo shoots, he posts about the reality of being a ballet dancer. A year ago, he was sidelined with a serious injury. It took him months of rehab. And then, last October, he made his long-awaited comeback. I was on stage performing an incredible ballet called Manon is breathtaking. I felt incredibly relaxed, actually. I said to myself, I'm finally back. I, I, I feel at ease. And uh, literally, after I had that thought in my head, I took off for a jump. It sounded like a, a little block of wood, like a wedge you stick under a door to keep it open. And I tried to step. My leg was not there to support me. <laughs> Uh, the orchestra was carrying on, playing and playing, but our stage management stepped out very quickly and the curtain came down. And unfortunately, the curtain is not soundproof. <laughs> and I, I do believe that much of the audience could hear me laying in the wings. At 34, Stephen is one of the most celebrated principals at the Opera House, but he's at an age where the body is more prone to injury. It's going. Come on! <laughs> more and more each week. Stephen's wife, Elizabeth, is also a dancer at the Royal Ballet. Well, you've danced together in public, have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah at the Opera House. Really? Sorts, yeah. What, what, what were you on? Um... Uh, you know, we've done, we did the Nutcracker together, actually. We met at ballet school. No, I've been terribly worried about him, obviously. It's, it's an enormous thing to go through, I think emotionally and mentally as much as physically in our profession. It's part of the job and fortunately it's as much a part of the job as the dancing side of things. But nevertheless, to know that you're one and only is in one in so much pain and then on the back of another substantial injury is, is hideous, it's awful. With any serious injury, the dancer needs to really believe they can get back on stage. You know, I need to be able to look at my children jumping without feeling sick at the thought that their Achilles might snap. Is that, was that something you actually felt then? Yes, yes. So the next step for Stephen will be to return to the Opera House and seek the help of a sports psychologist. Mm. 
as with all elite athletes, success at this level is not just down to physical ability, it's also down to an unshakable belief in themselves. It's something the most celebrated male dancer of all time was keenly aware of. What drove Rudolf Nureyev on was living on the edge of failure. The moment you have public there, that may be what makes it all exciting. You, you transform in front of those lights and in front of really glare of all those uh, eyes. What we are paid for is for our fear. Nureyev turned on its head all our preconceptions of male dance. But how would he compare with today's golden generation? When he arrived in London, Christopher Carr's career was just starting out. We've got five minutes. We have to make you and it look the best it can look. That is the name of the game, really, I think. Nice crossed legs, nice supported arms, nice bright eyes. Here we go, ready, and one, two, three, four, five, one. Oh, one. What emphasis on the one, Isabella, get over it. Oh, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. One. So were you a ballet dancer? I was a ballet dancer. What was your period? I joined the Royal Ballet Touring Company in 1967. And then eventually I became a ballet master. I danced actually until I was 40 years old. I'm very nearly 70 and I'm still going. <laughs> she was a pair of <laughs> Don't think I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> So do you remember um, Nureyev? Yes, I do. Can you talk a bit about that? <laughs> uh, I remember him. He was always last on the bill. He was very famous for coming down on the stage and holding the curtain up. He would practically do the whole ballet. And so we all just used to hang about until he exhausted himself because he believed that if he was tired, that he would give a much better performance. He would dance himself almost to death. He was unique in that he revolutionised ballet for men. The choreography for the male dancer becoming much more difficult and more inventive at that time. Rudolf Nureyev had movie star status. He transcended ballet and became a household name. I think if he was around now, he wouldn't be such a big star. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that, but there are now better dancers. But when he walked onto the stage, you couldn't fail but to notice him. I wonder what Nureyev would make of male ballet today, 60 years after he tore the rule book up. Hopefully, he'd notice that society has become more accepting of all types of masculinity. <sighs> that men don't just have to be powerful and strong to be men. And of course, when society changes, that change seeps through into the work on the stage too. Three, two, three, one. The Cellist two, by choreographer Kathy Marston is in production and tells the story of the virtuoso musician Jacqueline Dupre, who died tragically of multiple sclerosis. This modern ballet has all sorts of different roles for men. It's the inverse of a normal classical partnering. So in a classical ballet, the man usually stands behind the woman and supports her, lifts her, guides her. And of course, because the man in this case is being the cello. His cello position is in front of her with his arm outstretched and she's the one playing him and leading him. Marcelino Sambe is the newest principal at the Royal Ballet, promoted just this season. Oh, 
No one is here. Come on in. <laughs> He's been given the unconventional leading role. For me, it's quite cold. I need to choose the right outfit. I got my laundry done because I just love feeling the f smelling the fresh laundry smell. Quite obsessive over it, actually. Everybody's always telling me that it's become my trademark, smelling good. If I don't smell good, I feel really, like, not nice. The cellist, I'm trying to understand what a cello would feel like. If you play strings on a cello, you get this resonance. It vibrates. And you can play much more with how you're going to, like, you know, um, be a sound wave, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. Just that. <laughs> rising every day, my facial washing. I have such a huge skin routine before bed, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I'm gonna be the kind of people that's not gonna age gracefully. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I'll, 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 I'll make sure You'll that make this sure. <laughs> Even if I have to inject things in. In the moment, I think those two could be nice. Yeah, yeah. I think that could be nice. Love though. English. I'm gonna get my body. When you think of grassroots ballet, it conjures up images of quaint ballet classes in charming village halls. But Marcy's story could not be more different. He might be starring in a fashion shoot for a Squire magazine, but as a young boy growing up in a poor district of Lisbon, he was placed by his mother for adoption after his father had died. Wow, it's such a nice day. Welcome to the balcony. It's, it, it's kind of weird to think that you work in the centre centre of London. This is Covent Garden, it's always so lively. There's always such a sense of rhythm. And then it does add to that feeling of how lucky I feel to work in here. It's so important to, to have that notion of where you came from and what made you. I often wonder, my biological mum, I, th I think she was very supportive. She understood that I had something special and that's why she was so, so, so happy to have me move on to be able to fulfill my full potential. And I, I for, for that I forever, will forever be grateful because she really understood that I had an opportunity to build and do something of my life and that if that meant like that we had to sep go separate ways, that was fine and I'm so, that for me is the most amazing thing that has ever happened to me, to have that moment that someone that recognized, even though she, she probably doesn't know much about what I do, she recognized that I had something special and that I should pursue it. Marcy's circumstances are not that unique here at the ballet. You might think of this world as the preserve of the genteel middle class, but several of the young men have stories that might surprise you like Joseph Sissons, who experienced racism as a child, but has just landed his first leading role in Onyegin. Gosh, it's hard to describe. He's just got, I mean, he's got a phenomenal technique and his physical attributes are very, very good for ballet. And then he's got this amazing work ethic. He works super hard, really hard all the time. He's taken every opportunity and made the most of it. So I'm really pleased that he's got this. This is the next step for him, really. When I was seven, a scout leader pulled me aside and said, you're going to end up in prison by the time you're 18 with this kind of behavior. And there was no behavior. Like, it was, it was a child talking, like, squabbling over, like, a, a crayon. But because he saw me and he saw my color and he knew my family, he wanted to get that comment in to be like, you know your place. That fuels my fire a little bit, is to prove them wrong. And to, if they were to come and see me, to like do it 100% to prove that I am worth, like I am worth the time kind of thing. It's your responsibility to give a part of yourself. And I think those incredible dancers out there that are well known are those people that are themselves on stage. Like you can tell that there's no ego, it's just, giving and I think I can give because it, it can be a selfish art form you are looking at yourself in the mirror every single day 
improving how you look, improving how you do things. So you have to find a way in order to switch that around and to find a way of giving back to people that way. Otherwise, you do get internalized, and it's all about that. What I think is brilliant about ballet and dance is it, it cuts across so many barriers. And I think there is a misconception maybe that there are barriers to becoming a dancer. <laughs> I myself come from, you know, Yorkshire. I, I, I wasn't around ballet, um, but um, if you've got a talent, the Royal Ballet School will take you in. And I think that's really important. And so you can then be with people to train and become who you want to be. That was pretty perfect. I have to say, I wouldn't say it very often, but it was unbelievably beautiful. OK, we don't do it again now till Friday. <laughs> so Friday <laughs> night, I think. <laughs> During a performance, the dancer and the audience feed off one another. And for the principals, a good performance can result in many curtain calls and several elaborate bowing routines. But for the men in the corps de ballet, the curtain calls are rather more restrained. It's common knowledge, like we all just know how you bow, how mm. you... Although I think for the women, sometimes curtain calls can be... It's very set. ...very set with, they might just do a one-arm pas de bras, they might do a full arm, they might go all the way to the knee, they might just do a small... They have it's... a number of steps, so they're all on yeah. the same leg, whereas boys can't be trusted to be on the same leg, so we just put two feet together. Most of the time, they don't even let us lift an arm, we just bow yeah, our just heads. Head. And if you're feeling really posh, you can they do an arm. Yeah. This must be what the graduates across the road at the upper school dream about at night. Love emanating from the audience. Hands up here who would like to one day be a principal. Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh. Unfortunately, not all of them will make it to the rank of principal. In fact, today, only a few will be offered a place in the corps de ballet but who will it be? To the front, place, squeeze, to the back. Squeeze, squeeze, and turn. These teenagers have been living and breathing ballet for almost half their lives. Hello. How are you? Hi, do you take a seat. It is a year's contract. You've had an outstanding time. I've watched you since White Lodge. And, uh, and so it's great to see you really come through the school. And, and I'd like to offer you a place. Thank you. Good to see you again. Well, well done. Thank well you. Done. Very good. I think I'm going to tell, tell my parents, like now. <laughs> now congratulations. I think it's, it'd be really great to have you as part of the, the Royal Ballet. You do get paid, by the way. I, might, I should tell everybody that, shouldn't I? Because it's, uh, it's a proper salary. Yes. <laughs> It's a one-year contract, and I don't offer this contract to anybody that I don't believe should be in the Royal Ballet. Thank so you very much. That's, I think that's it for, for now. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you guys to A&B now. <laughs> <laughs> James, Daichi and Danielson. I told you, I told you. They're the lucky ones. Can I ring my mum? <laughs> This will always be one of the high points in these young men's careers, but there will also be lows too. What lies at the heart of ballet is the dancer's battle to push their own body to its absolute limits. The quest for perfection versus the risk of injury. You can't have one without the other, which is why the mind needs to be so resilient.
to feel that loss. You think you're okay, but... Mm. You, know, you go from this figure of being on stage, obviously, where everybody is watching you, and you know, I guess you almost look not human on stage. It's about being superhuman. Yeah, and you almost appear untouchable. Mm, yeah. And then to suddenly, mm. literally at the click of a finger, mm. bang, mm. and you're the most vulnerable creature in the entire room with everybody staring at you. Mm. Um, that's a huge, huge thing to, to, to go through. It's kind of taking that internal pressure off, really, because it's, it's such grief, it's such loss, it's such pain. You can't mm. even begin to try and understand what goes on mm -hmm. when something like what happened to you happens. Yeah. And, it's, and it's like what happens is that the lid gets stuck. But the, the, the feelings, those feelings, are still stuck underneath that mm. lid. The, the, like you said, the, the tears, they, it did, they didn't stop. An, a natural mm. experience after having gone through such a traumatic event. Mm, mm. It's a, it's, it's a, an effect of actually what goes on in your mind, what you, what you're thinking mm -hmm. in those dark places. Tonight is the final night of Sleeping Beauty, which has been playing to sell out audiences for several weeks. <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> it means it's also the final night that Cesar will have to perform the notorious Bluebird routine. How are you feeling today? Wanna know some drama? Yeah, do you wanna know some drama, some fresh gossip? So, I got a spasm. You what, sorry? I got a spasm. Next spasm. I got a next spasm. Is it still painful now? Yeah. But so you just deal with it. But you just deal with it. You act like nothing's so. happening, you know? Does it mean you can't move your head? Pretty much. Imagine like you have like hands just grabbing onto your neck muscles. Have you been to physio? Yeah, I am. When? Appointment at three o'clock. Don't get nervous. Get it's probably gonna do some acupuncture. Oh, be careful. Ooh, you're on in the show tonight. You gotta watch out. Meant to be. That's all right. What have you got? Cavaliers? No. Bluebird. Bluebird tonight. <laughs> Would be my eighth. Don't you miss that bluebird tonight. <laughs> he's tonight. No, he's not off tonight. <laughs> Surely a bluebird is the most <laughs> difficult thing to do if you've had a neck spasm. It can sometimes help because you can get so hot and so warm. <laughs> and actually, it can actually relieve it rather than putting a heat pack on. Just do bluebird. Just do <laughs> Says, ah. Uh, that's all right, we can do it. You should catch us and tell me off. We can do it. That blue bird is so bad. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the acupuncture didn't work. It's now five hours before the curtain goes up. When I finished the rehearsal, the secretary called me, which is never good news. He was like, Come to the office, we need to speak to you. I have to take, uh, I'm sorry, I think tonight you have to do Bluebird. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Just part of it. In, in fact, every show, we have to be in the house until half an hour before the show. Just to make sure. <laughs> You're cracking. It's quite a hard thing to pick up, but it's, you know, it's one of the highlights of the, of, of the Sleeping Beauty, really, dancing-wise. So, you know, just uh, do my best. I still got five hours to kind of wrap my head around it. The closing night of any production always feels like a special occasion. For tonight's performance, Vadim has been cast as the prince. I grown up uh, watching uh, Rodolf Nureyev performing uh, Sleeping Beauty Soul, so he's my everyday inspiration and my idol as well. So it's an uh, honor for me to, to dance this role. Just have a shot with No, I don't. Look at my uh... The new recruits, James, Daichi and Danielson, are going to get their first experience of being on the famous stage. What part are you playing today? Footman. Footman. Are you standing still or are you moving around? We are standing, standing still. still. Principal character artist Gary Avis 
is playing an English prince. I'm just going to show you what it's what happens when you put it on. But this is like this is very. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. Do you have to wear that? Is this been oh said? Have you set this up officially? <laughs> no, only kidding. <laughs> Valentino will perform his Bluebird routine just a few minutes before Vadim comes on for the grand finale. The pain gets more and more and more. I had a little opera house book when I was little mm -hmm. and the paper theatre of the Royal Opera House. So the most exciting part for me is being on the stage that I made when I was like 10, the little paper theatre that I put the Sleeping Beauty set in or different operas. And um, yeah, to be on the actual set now and stages, yeah, it's like a full circle for my childhood dreams. One minute to stage, one minute to dance. Number one. Where will these three young dancers be in 10 years' time? Perhaps they'll be taking a curtain call, having enthralled the audience with a scintillating rendition of Bluebird. Or maybe they will have led the whole ballet as the principal. Wait, that actual solo? Seriously? <laughs> It was like textbook, oh, wasn't thank it? You. It thank was you. amazing. Not all dancers have, uh, like in their own generation, they saw Baryshnikov, Nureyev. So those dancers who were younger and they were watching, they were always inspired by them. Now... We have a dream. Vadim and Marina <laughs> inspired no. our younger generation. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Now he's going, I'm going to cry now. <laughs> no, thank you. What should you do if you're not getting the breaks you think you deserve? Because a ballet dancer's career is famously short. And at some point, all dancers reach that final stage in their careers when they realize they can dance no more. Ed Watson has had one of the longest and most celebrated careers at the ballet. But a few months ago, he had a realization. I guess smiling was a big moment for me because I loved the ballet. I'd, I'd always wanted to do it. It is an incredible story to tell about the double suicide of the Crown Prince Rudolf of Austria and his teenage mistress. And there's a point in the ballet which isn't a dance at all, but an opera singer that sings a song about leaving. It, it's a really important moment. The words are talking about everybody's leaving something, a relationship, and eventually sort of, I guess, down to leaving this life. And uh, the words are all there, so it's kind of nice to have them up there before a show. How long have you been in this dressing room? Um, probably about 10 years, I guess. Ten years. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> How would you describe your career? <laughs> a mess, a bit random. Uh, yeah, full. I guess it's full. It's been full. Most male dancers hang up their ballet shoes by the age of 40. Ed Watson will be 42. And so now you're thinking about retirement? Yeah. Uh, and have you come to terms with that idea? Yeah, I, I really have, you know, and it, it is a funny thing. And, you know, I asked people, you know, how did you know? And all anyone said to me was, you'll just know. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to. I still feel really good. And, and then you just do. You just do a show and you don't get that same buzz or it's harder to get there. And you realise there isn't the next thing to achieve anymore. You have achieved and it would just be repeating. Just try the other way. Ed will not be leaving the ballet. Do a bit more twist with her round so it all happens there rather than on the way. He's following in the footsteps of Gary and Christopher and started coaching. So turn with her up still and now down. It's a whole other 
way of thinking, really. It sort of fired me up again to help someone else go beyond what I did. And so the life cycle of ballet continues, older stars passing on their wisdom to the younger generation. As in this studio, where our new graduates are starting rehearsals of a completely original routine. Only men are being cast in this piece, which aims to celebrate masculinity. And it's been created by a new young choreographer. Seven, eight, two, three, four, nine. Valentino. And two and three, five, good. And I suppose in a sense, choreography might be your future, might not it? It's definitely going to be sort of like one of the branches that I want to go to. You know, I have a few ideas of what to do in the future with that, and I hope to see more ballets centered on male characters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one. You know, in this particular instance, I'm trying to gather all those kind of male attributes which are positive and putting them into a piece, which can be like camaraderie, healthy competition. So, you know, it's very friendly, it's very shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder dancing. You know, when boys are in a, in a studio together, you will see they will start doing tricks and sort of uh, trying to out-pirouette each other. Do you think that you've come to terms in your career of not being a principal? I've come to terms with the fact that I might not have that title and what comes with it, which is a certain status, but I still feel that I, I, can, I can do some sort of like big roles and there's still a lot I can give. I suppose you could probably become a principal at a different ballet company. Would that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've actually had offers to do that. The thing is that I have a certain attachment to this place. Uh, you know, I love the Royal Ballet. I actually had to fight a little bit to get in here in the first place. So, uh, to be honest, I don't really want to be anywhere else. Uh, so even though I could, so I, I, I didn't want to leave somewhere I love for, for a status or a title. When you walk around and then you're there and then we're there and oh, all of that. Use the eyes, use the ends of the hands, there. So what have we learned about the male ballet dancer? That each new generation faces the challenge of making a dance like the Bluebird even more spectacular than the generation before. That the male dancers today are fusing art and athleticism in ways not seen in the past. That ballet accepts all kinds of men, regardless of who they are or where they're from. And we've learned that many male dancers are still having to swim against the tide to get to where they are today. But the thought I'd like to leave you with is this. We are, at last, learning to love these men in tights almost yeah. as much Good. as those ballerinas Good. in their tutus. Yes. yes. Wow, I'd pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Two glorious acts from the Ballet Boys' most recent production, Deluxe, later tonight at 10.30. Next on BBC Four, Gemma Arterton, Geraldine James, Mira Sayal and James Norton in three more lockdown stories, unprecedented.